Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and so this is my channel 984. Today I would like to put together one of my systems I've been collecting parts for for a couple of years. I want to put together a Windows Vista machine to run some of my favorite games like Fallout 3. So for that I want to use a GTX 295. So that's what I have here. This is a restored and working one. This is a partially disassembled now one that is broken but the same as this one and this is the later revision so you can see there's quite a difference on those two but they are both well, all, all three of them are GTX 295s so that is a dual GPU with the internal SLI so you don't need an SLI motherboard to use one but you can actually use two of them because there is a header on all of them so there's also one there so this is essentially the card we're gonna use at the working one so as you can see here, there's a PCB on either side. So this is the dual PCB version. So I have both sides as a GPU. So there should be one down there. There's a kind of like a stiffening frame for it. Probably so you won't break the balls when you tighten it down. And there should be one down there too. So there's a stiffening frame around it, but the GPU is under it. So you basically have a heatsink with two bases on base here and yeah, this is a base here, but uh, got a black lip here. And then you got the fin stack in between. And also the ability for it to blow out hot air here. So about half comes out here, the other half here. And we have a radial fan here. This thing during heavy benchmarking runs at 3000 RPMs and idles at 2000. So it's not point really building a quite case or anything for this unless you water cool it because this is this is why people hate blowers i don't hate blowers but this is uh, not a good blower uh, the, the main fault i think is if you just look at the design here the kind of white spacing on them and i have to do that because they decided to blow somewhere out here and some here so the fins are stacked like so instead of being parallel so the gap is kind of narrow here where the fan is and the spacing between the fins but it gets progressively bigger so they could have had added more fins if they had well all gone this way i think would have been better but it is what it is and uh, this is the later version the single pcb one so i got the backpacks here the memory under there so the memory is actually mounted on the back side here to fit all of it uh, also memory on this side. All the GTX 295s are rated at about 289 watts and uh, this fan on this particular card I is at about 1500 and max is around 1800 usually. So a lot quieter and it also runs about 20 degrees cooler so around 60 while the older version is about 80. But this is uh, this has inferior VRMs I've been told and they are different and uh, the you can't see the VRM temperatures on this card or the current load, but you can do that on uh, one of these. So, and they are visually different uh, VRMs if you have a look at the, like the MOSFETs with power stages. So apparently, if you really is into the like if you're into retro hardware and want uh, the best quality, this is the one to get. I suppose if you just want to run them not get uh, hearing damage this is the better one but yeah, if you can find a water block the, the double pcb one should be the better one and i this one was broken i uh, had to fix a lot of stuff on the pca side of things here was stuff missing here didn't so the, a lot of motherboard couldn't find it because then it had to be gen 2 or higher as this card is this uh, capacitors were important for that uh, so it would so Gen 1 motherboard would find it uh, and there was a lot of stuff missing on the back here like a lot of caps uh, sisters just like basically like some like a screwdriver to it so this is working but it's kind of not working either it doesn't affect anything it just something sends a trigger that power is not good anymore so you have a vrm for the each gpu for each memory set and other things something trips the card it could be the GPU itself I'm not sure if these can like erroneously send this temp trip if the temperature goes too high 
was told that they should, if that happens, just go into like a 2D power state and lose performance for a short moment. But yeah, the GPUs should be capable of tri tripping the cards if they find something to be wrong. So yeah, this card trips randomly, so that's a bit sad because it's otherwise working. So I can't use this if I want to like play a game and not have to <laughs> basically restart the computer every two hours. So that's a bit sad. Otherwise, we could have done quarter slide. That was my idea. Obviously, quarter slide with two of these would have been cooler, but this has a dead GPU because it was full of dust. Also, why this is repainted is because this is not sticky, but this one and that one was super sticky. Like, I had to like really mm, do some alcohol for like half an hour to get this not to stick my fingers. Like, you had to basically rip it off your hands. So I repainted that one, like metal clean, uh, cleaned it down to the metal and painted that one. It also like new pads, new paste, everything. And it's the best parts of both cards. So whatever was broken on one card, but not the other one. So that will be the card we're going to use. This GTX 295 has, like I said, two GPUs. Those are Tesla 2.0 based and are called GT 200B. So I've got, got one on either side here. Uh, they have 448 bit memory bus each, like come with 896 megabyte of DDR3 RAM running at about, I think, 2 GHz effectively, uh, or 1 GHz, depending on how you count DDR. Uh, the GPUs themselves run, run at 576 MHz and runs at 1.03 volts. So just, uh, they have PCA 2.0 times 16, and then built-in uh, like a multiplexer uh, from Nvidia, so you can split off both GPUs so they can have their own PCIe lanes. So like I said, I completely restored this card. It's a custom paint job, painted logo. Even paint, repainted this part here because it was also all sticky. It was like the, the clear coat they used turned into some kind of rubber. And just, like you can roll it off, it was disgusting. Uh, yeah. I think it's a really beautiful card when it turned out really nicely. It's worth effort. So we're gonna use this. This is an awfully nice card, I can tell you that. Uh, the highest RPM I got to find out was 3000 RPM at about 85 centigrades. So yeah, they do have a tendency to cook themselves to that. So you do need to make sure they're 100% free from dust. And this has new paste, also mod idea. Very simple mod. It reminds, probably reminds people that of the RX 5700 XT shim mod. Basically these four screws here are the only thing applying pressure to the like the GPU. You have multiple of these screws. A small spring around them. I did put uh, like a stainless steel washer on them. Because these springs are very very weak. So the, there's no not, nothing else that pushes this to the to the heatsink. And then if you have the card mounted like this, like normally, the PCA would pull on this too. So basically the card wants to fall away from the heatsink. So this GPU on this side ran about 90 degrees. On the other one ran at like 82, 81, 82. So adding these extra shims here dropped the temperature difference to about 2 degrees. So when this is like 85, the other one is 83. Uh, and yeah, the other side started to run a little bit hotter, but that's not that odd because we've got better cooling efficiency on this side now, which means the heatsink is slightly warmer instead. So, but you want the GPUs to be very close. And it seems like the temperature is actually determined by this GPU on this side here. And this side doesn't have that problem because if we look at the other car, uh, you can see here some rubbery standoffs here. Around here. So when you mount uh, this cover on, it screws into here, here, I think over here, and here. And you basically have to like push it down to screw it in, which means this PCB is squished against the heatsink, and this one wants to fall away by gravity. So that's why I. Uh, shim modded this card and uh, like six degree six seven degree difference is a lot especially when the card wants to kill itself with heat so yeah i think this uh, this is gonna be the start of my show so to speak uh, this build and 
And like because I couldn't do uh, SLI, I'm not gonna buy one of these cards. Like two years ago, we could buy one of these cards working for like 50 euros, maybe 40. Today, 40, 50 euros buys you a broken one, 150 buys a working one. In two years, they have gone up in price, it seems, and then it's starting to be more scarce. It's not like you can't find them, you just have people starting to ask a lot. The cheapest I found was two for 150 in Sweden. One of each type, so a single PCB and a double PCB one. But yeah, I don't feel like paying that. So what I decided to do instead was actually vertical mount this. So we can have this in a case with the glass panel on and do like a showpiece system. I'm really not into like all the RGB stuff and LEDs, but um, I think some lighting and the glass panel on this vertical mount is gonna be pretty cool for a show system. So for motherboard, I sourced this Asus M2N32 SLI Deluxe with Wi-Fi, which by the way is kind of crooked because I think someone hit this motherboard with something. But I got this at some retro gathering, I think in Gothenburg. I don't know who donated it or what, but I remember vaguely it being free more or less. So it came with a CPU, I think. I think it was a complete system. I just took the motherboard and the CPU before. Also, one thing I noticed with this one is the back side is blue and the front side is black. So, this is an SLI motherboard, and it's also why I kind of like realized hmm, maybe I can do a quad SLI. But uh, obviously, when I tested my graphics card thoroughly, now I realized one actually isn't stable, like I said. So, this uh, we're gonna scrap that and do a vertical mount here instead. So this motherboard is uh, an N Force 590 SLI chip. So you got two times 16, then I got four times uh, one times four and one times one. I don't remember the exact number, and I've seen different numbers, but I think this chipset by itself has something in the order of 36 to 38 PCIe lanes. It's quite well equipped. It's an AM2 motherboard, so we're gonna like you can use. Uh, Atalon uh, 64X2, I think first generation Phenom, and there are Phenom 2s, I think for AM2+. Plus. But this motherboard actually, we can upgrade the BIOS to and run AM3 Phenoms in it. Uh, it's not officially supported by AMD, but AMD didn't didn't uh, like forbid um, uh, the motherboard manufacturers from releasing new BIOSes, so this actually supports AM3 CPUs despite being AM2 only motherboard. So this motherboard has pretty much everything you probably want. I think this dual gigabit, obviously sound, you've got eSATA, uh, optical for audio, you've got Wi-Fi, magnifying antenna though. And what I like about this board is that uh, the socket is rotated, so you've got your memory over here. So this should have a, have a pretty good memory topology for overclocking. Uh, so that's what I like. Uh, and there's a light support obviously and it has uh, solid capacitors under here there are eight phases also do like the actual heat sinks have uh, heat pipes connecting everything so you've got two heat pipes here for the VRM and one of them goes over to here and to here so you've got the two ships here modern motherboard uh, I don't know what they're doing with the uh, VRMs anymore you have some big plastic LCD over here and a big heat sink that only traps heat because the thing runs into nothing. I don't know what to do any, anymore with that. I do like this setup because this actually works. If you have a tower cooler, you can blow over that and suck the heat out of everything. Or you can have a top-down blower, a top-down uh, cooler. Will you exploit both of these? You can obviously have a tower cooler going this way, sucking some air through there. And it's a pretty convenient way of cooling your motherboard components, uh, chipset and VRMs. Um, today they seems to throw more plastic and metal, uh, aluminium plates over everything, just uh, trapping heat. So yeah, that's the motherboard we're gonna use. For uh, CPU, I'm gonna go with an Athlon 64X2 6400 Plus, and uh, you might think, isn't that kind of old? And this thing came out in uh, August 2007 and uh, the GTX 295 came out in January 2009 so there is uh, like a one year and three months or so difference or four. 
So yeah, but the thing is, I checked when I bought this. My parents had this in this main read for a long time. This was bought in 2008. And the reason why you would buy something like this in 2008 was that it was fairly cheap. This one retailed. We paid 128 euros for this, according to my receipt. And uh, the thing is, the alternative was usually a Phenom, which has a quad-core -quad CPU, but usually lower clocked with the TLB bug. This is quite high clocked and isn't that much slower on IPC. With the TL bug factor in the Phenom, this is probably faster. So in terms of games of the time, uh, more than two cores and more than two threads wasn't really used. So a quad would be if you really wanted to like, oh, I'm believing future games gonna work on this machine and have more threads. And you wanted to pay more too. So you could either get this or you could get a Core 2 Duo. I had an E8400 and actually ran that with a GTX 260 because my father had a GTX 980 with this and it broke and I had bought one at the same store. So I sold mine. So he got a uh, 80i 5850 and I got a GTX 260. So having something like that with a CPU like this wasn't that uncommon because a lot of people replaced their 8 or 9000 series GPUs with a 200 series or a 5000 series from AMD. So, uh, and I don't find this CPU to be limited in the GTX 295. Like if you start up Crisis with the 295 versus the 260, the 295 is notably faster. Uh, and you really want to run high resolution anyway, this kind of a point with a, like an SLI setup I would say. So if you run any reasonable resolution, then this is kind of a problem. The GTX 295 is uh, marketed kind of at like a 1600p graphics card. And that's because you had 1610 monitors by then. So today it would be like a 1440p graphics card. So yeah, this is, uh, the, back to the CPU, this is a uh, 2.2 gear uh, dual core based on the K8. So it's the fastest and the last K8 of the original Atalons. So this is a 125 watt chip, runs at about 1.4 volts. It's not that cool, uh, hard to cool, but uh, trying to overclock it or overvolt it, it runs away pretty fast. And we're gonna look at that because there's actually an issue with the motherboard. Or was. So yeah, this is an AM2 CPU, pretty fast dual core. Not as fast as that equally clocked core to do it. This is uh, around the uh, C2D 6700. 6750 maybe performance level though the core to do overclocks much better this overclocks pretty much nothing because it's like maxed out of the box uh, you can overclock it a little bit uh, maybe 100 megahertz from air and 200 on water depending on your luck and depending on what stresses do you run because if you run prime you're gonna find it to run away pretty fast on you if you try to overvolt it i think a lot of people like the core to do and it has a lot of coverage uh, figure why not an atom 64 x2 and yeah, it has two megabytes of cache, one, per one meg per core. So for RAM, I did source some new memory because I didn't have that much DDR2, especially nothing super fast. Yeah. Uh, because the old RAM for the Altalon 64X2 was sold to a friend of mine on his broke many years ago. So that was kind of out of RAM. So this, I got a good deal on this on an auction. I bought four of these sticks. They are 2 gigabyte, uh, rated at 1066 megahertz. So we can see it here. Uh, uh, so you can see here 2048 megabytes, 1066 megahertz, 555 15 timings, uh, 2.1 volts, and that's a little bit of a stock version 1.1. There's two kits here because these were sold in pairs. So there's a version 1.1 and 1.2 kit here. So usually you would only run two of these sticks. Uh, they only, like according to the PDF, they binned and sold as pair and only guaranteed to work as one pair. So actually buying multiple of them is, well, maybe not recommended, but yeah. I got these for 18 euros total, so. And I'm gonna run four of them. Uh, the CPU and motherboard is only rated at 800 megahertz. That's because the AMT to platform the memory controllers in the CPU and it can only only have dividers up to 800. You can overclock the bus or not this like the hyper transport bus, the base clock, VCLK, 
to and lower the multiplier that way you can force up the memory clock so that's what we're gonna do and uh, surprisingly enough when i tested it took me a lot of time because the motherboard buys this crap and did a lot of stupid things but i actually got all these four sticks up mem test and prime 95 stable at 1066 at 2.1 volts uh, so basically i run this i have a gigabyte board at budget one it cannot run uh, run uh, these the speeds with four sticks on the two so yeah, the, that's why, like I said, I like the memory to pull you up the of the AM, AM, and M to N to the two S line motherboard. So yeah, that's the RAM I'm gonna use. Uh, we're also gonna use an SSD for storage uh, because it's fast and simple. And uh, I actually got this in an RMA case because I had a hundred twenty gigabyte version of this, hundred twenty uh, in like a Windows ten. Atlan 2 machine running some Quake 3 and stuff online. And it, uh, Windows Update uh, killed my SSD, so smart, so decided to lock it permanently. So I got a new one, and uh, they said, well, uh, bad news for you, we don't have the 120 anymore. Good news is you're uh, gonna give you a 240 for free. No no, no difference in price, so I didn't have to pay anything, shipping anything. So I have, the thing is, I scrapped that machine because I didn't trust it because. Uh, Something I noticed that like old N4 motherboards do is that they then the SATA controller in the chips that dies. So I have I had uh, two of those machines slightly different, but uh, one I got for free had a brand new hard drive and the uh, problem was the the, the motherboards uh, N4 four chips that was dying. And this one had one of those too though with extra cooling because I knew they needed it. But yeah, so I decided not to use that system, scrap it and keep the SSD around. So I'm gonna use it in this build and I think 240 gigs should be enough for this machine of this type. So for CPU cooling, I actually have the, not like the original AMD cooler, but the original cooler for the system the CPU came out of. So this is a uh, Nexus HOC 9000 heatsink. It's a top down like blower style. Go through. So that's pretty good I think for the motherboard with the layout of the VRMs. Uh, the only thing I don't like is this old style of uh, heat pipes integration here where they just like sand them all flat. Uh, doesn't cover the full HS, so it's kind of annoying. But it's not a bad cooler at all. It was fairly cheap, I, can, I think like 47 euros or something. So pretty big. This is 120 millimeters. So I actually have the original fan here. So, uh, hypnosis pattern. Uh, not gonna use the original fan those. And these heat pipes are 8 millimeters, so that's pretty beefy. So, yeah, we're gonna use this one. Probably not the best cooler, but definitely not a bad cooler. You can easily like uh, cool 125 watt CPU with uh, an 800 RPM fan that I've tested. Because that's, that's how it, uh, the Atom 64. Ran. So that's what we're gonna use, and the mounting is kind of probably the weakest point of this cooler. It's like an AMD standard um, hook system for the frame. The problem is with this cooler here is that uh, very hard to show, but they essentially got grooves. You can see them here, two going this way, and we got two going that way. But there is nothing here on this one to stop it from sliding. So I think if I do like this, we just slide. So the problem is you can actually have this offset by accident relative to the IGS. Also it could be an advantage if you have, because this would actually fit on like your modern rise and kind of CPUs because of this mounting. So you could actually take me do an off, off uh, center mount. I think the Bauer did that on the new uh, Zen 4 with the AM5. You can technically do that if you really know where the ship is and where is the most convenient pla place to locate the CPU cooler. But mostly from practical point of view it's just annoying. So that's one thing that is also down some of this cooler. But once it's mounted properly this cooler it works really well. You just have to fill the grooves here with paste first so it, so it just doesn't stop. So usually, the, I think the recommended method was to put the paste on each heat pipe here. 
another way that works is just a lot of paste and then a razor blade or credit card and just until you just squeeze it out until you get the dim between the aluminium frame here and the heat hives. Just so it doesn't fill up those and paste just goes down there and then stops at the end before you get out to the outer heat pipes. So I like to pre-apply uh, it to this cooler first to make sure you have enough. Otherwise uh, you're wasting your heat pipe for nothing. For case I bought a um, budget case, a uh, Cooler Master CMP 510. So it's a very bare bone case but it, it's small, it has a glass panel. And it comes with the uh, three front mounted ARGB fans and an ARGB controller that would only do R RGB puke, which I suppose is 20% more FPS, but yeah. I'm gonna replace that with the one that can actually run a fixed color because I only want something that is very light blue to, to match the blue on the graphics card. It's the plan. So back here we have some uh, remove ones. Uh, brackets been removed so the idea here is to say uh, vertical mount so it's basically just an adapter that goes in where you have uh, the add-on cards so this is from Pantech or Pantech I don't know how it's pronounced it basically goes in like so and you screw, screw it into place essentially and it comes with a PCIe adapter with riser up to your motherboard now for this to actually work in this particular case, some cases don't have these ribbons anymore in between. But this one has, and I don't really care about wanting to check that the fans run, so that's fine. Probably the only thing that can really break, I haven't checked the power button. <laughs> yeah. So the plan is to cut these off, then we uh, can put this in, because if we don't cut these off, uh, the, the display port will hit this. So that's the next thing to do to cut these off and then we will also add a fan here and a new CPU fan and connect that to the, the ARGB controller. So we connect it to, an, to a different ARGB controller. I got one from Fractal which actually supports fixed, fixed colors and I think you can have somehow sample like you can, you can cycle and think you can pick one. But anyway, um, the reason I went with ARGB crap is because it's basically the same price as just buying any other types of fans or case. And uh, so if I were to buy a more traditional case and then buy some LED strips and stuff, it would cost more. So th this kind of worked out costing about the same except for this adapter, but this was like 17 euros. So yeah, and I could have bought a case also with a working amount here, but the PCIe cable is the expensive part. It's like you would save like. 10 on the buying the cable without uh, uh, the vertical mount but you would pay more for the case um, and also uh, those cases tend to be wider so this case would actually not fit in my shelf because I got limited space so those cases were too wide I want a pretty small case because it makes the component looks bigger um, you don't you don't want the component to look like the other place being way too small. So for example here we have the broken one. It should be mounted like so. And we get a um, few inches here. So if I had bought a more traditional size case, the, the, it would probably be like at least five two inches or five centimeter deeper. Would have been wider. So yeah. And also this allows uh, it's pretty nice to have some space here. So in case I ever have to replace this GPU with something else if it breaks, uh, uh, like with uh, like a normal uh, open air cooler, it's kind of nice not to have it up against the glass. So yeah, that's why I picked like uh, this case and an adapter, and also why I went RGB was because uh, it was cheaper to do like that way. Trying to buy ordinary LED fans, I actually looked at some kind of nice ones from Corsair, but they were like twenty five to thirty euros each, and if one there one for CPU in the front that would have cost a lot of in uh, just to get LED fans with one fixed one specific color so yeah so we got a sheet with some RGB fans but uh, they're gonna be fixed so yeah. I'm gonna pretend they're LEDs which the taking the are yeah. uh, let's mount uh, the CPU RAM and cooler on the motherboard it's gonna be a little bit tricky to get to the screws but I have uh, Taking it in and out with the cooldown before, so I know it works, so that's not an issue. 
Also, why I like to mount the cooler now is, like I said, uh, I want to make sure it ends up in the perfect place. Uh, it's gonna be tight with the riser, but from my measurements and everything, and the way the riser goes in now, because I have done the modification to the case, should be able to put the card in on the riser or the, or the vertical stand. So, can just mount the card in the vertical stand and uh, put that in as one unit. So, that should slide in under the cooler, but it's gonna be tight. But I like that way better because uh, it's not as fun to have to take off the CPU cooler if you want to have the graphics card out every time. So anyway, let's mount the CPU here. Uh, so. Actually, I'm gonna skip the RAM just for now because you can get the RAM in anyway. You just like angle it and then. So I'm gonna do the CPU. I'm doing it this way because uh, I want to get the paste in between the heat pipes here so the gap is filled. Probably have too much paste and too little on this particular heat sink. All the excess is gonna go into these grooves here. I found a lot of old paste of all kinds there. Arctic silver, some generic white stuff, some MX4. You can kind of tell the difference from the color and particles when you clean it up. So anyway, this should be more than enough, I think. So that's the CPU cooler and RAM and the CPU obviously. So this can go into the case now. So I put the case on the desk here so we can put the motherboard in. Install an SSD here, so there's some studs uh, screwed in here and some rubber bushings here. And I think when we've done this, we're gonna put in the power supply so we can hook up the motherboard and sort up power here. So, for power, I have this pretty old but still fully working uh, Corsair GS700, so it's a 7 watt unit has uh, built-in LED, which is always on, and you can, you can set the color here, but this always starts up at blue. So. I guess that's a good thing though, because uh, since we're going on a blue team, black and blue, black with the case, blue with the graphics card, I cleaned it up. So, but yeah, 
So usually you would mount um, with the fan down since most cases the last 10, 10 years has the piece with the bottom and uh, allows the PSU to suck air from the outside. This case allows you to mount it either way. So you might have noticed uh, on the case before uh, there are holes on the top side of the PSU cover. So I'm thinking putting this up in the case because of the well, the, the, the blue light is going to help illuminate the card. And the uh, alternative is that you're going to see this through the cover plate. I could obviously move that, but yeah. And temperature wise, this is going to suck you in a lot of hot air because the way the graphics card, when it comes mounted over here, it's going to blow upwards out back. So this will mostly draw in cold air from the bottom front fan in the case. So. The only real risk I see if you drop a screw in there. It's not, not that easy to drop a screw anti-gravity wise. So yeah, I'm thinking I'm gonna put it in that way because temperature wise this isn't really a big deal with this configuration. And yeah, so i will already go with the static for show. And why not? If you can see a little bit of the power supply, why not? So as I mentioned, here's the PSV cover and you can see here have some holes there. Uh, obviously the riser or the vertical mount is going to cover it somewhat but uh, still hovers uh, a centimeter above almost half an inch so it's gonna still be visible so that's my idea since the the uh, hot there is gonna go up out here anyway due to the graphics card design so th this thing will really just get cold air from the front from this fan anyway so it's not not a big deal in that regard I have pulled uh, the 8x cable and power cables through the openings down here. They're pretty big, so that's pretty nice. And being down here, another advantage with the vertical mount is that it's going to hide a lot of the cables, like the SATA cable, front panel, audio. And this stupidly placed power plug, it's actually over here. That's the 12 volts. It makes sense that it is there from how the motherboard is designed, but from an, if you want to have a clean uh, cable run is not that easy with the normal, like uh, like normally. I can kind of hide it under the CPU cooler, which I did before. So yeah, this should then latest be hidden by a vertical mount, pretty nicely, I think. Rise the cable. It should work. I'm gonna swap out the RGB controller because it's garbage. The ones came with it. I think technically we might be able to have used some like mod not motherboard control but USB control ones because there is something called Open RGB or something. But I don't want to waste CPU resources. Even even if, even if it was a modern PC, I wouldn't want to waste that on something like that. And like I said, the main reason I went RGB is because it was cheaper. I'm also going to install some more fans, but for right now I'm just going to hook this up here. Oh, this is magnetic. Magnetic. Essentially, you can just replace this that one with this one. This one supports fixed colors, so I can have red, blue, like I want, and nothing else. So I'm basically going to simulate L the old school LED fans. My plan. So before we install the riser, I'm going to install a fan at the back, so we have some good exhaust. So the fan I'm using is from Enet in Sweden. They're like some rebranded fans, I guess. What's the cheapest stuff they had? I couldn't really find a good picture of them. They have pictures, but they're too clean. So yeah. But uh, the good thing with them, my I shoes them is, uh, well, I hope they were. I found someone at gallery since the lineup. But a lot of fans today have like uh, the holes on either side. They have a uh, no gap so to speak here anymore they're kind of solid and uh, my cpu fan 
I mounted here uh, with those rubber uh, pull straps, whatever you call it, like Nukta uses to. Uh, they don't really work with a lot of modern fans. So, yeah, one reason I picked them and the price. So, they were like 8 euros a pop, and I've seen them on sale on their website for like 4 euros sometimes. So let's test it. Uh, yeah, let's power. So it's posting at least. Let's see what happens if we do that. So we're in the BIOS here and I have uh, set the time, I don't have to bother with that. I'm gonna go to the uh, hardware monitor here. So here you can see some parameters, uh, CPU, Q, fan controller, just like uh, RPM, uh, RPM control for your CPU fan, you can do this for cases too. Uh, so this is vCore, I can set that to ignore for example. And it's actually 1.4. If you set it 1.4 manually, you're getting 1.44. So it's like 40 millivolts over, either over or it's reading incorrectly a little bit. But that's not that important. So you can see CPU temperature around 37, 38. We've got CPU fan warning here. We can set uh, up to 1600. But we can't set any other kind of warnings like temperature or anything like that. And that's kind of important actually, so especially on this board. So if we go, uh, we can see here at the bottom, gray, just under here, we got 8 gigs of RAM. And CPU configuration, we got the 3200 megahertz CPU. We go to jumper free here, this is where we can set our clocks and stuff. So we have to set this to manual. Uh, CPU frequency, that's our BCLK on mod modern motherboards. It's not the front side bus, this is the hyper transport bus essentially. On the reference clock, so we can set that something higher. I read this board can do like 350, but we need 266 because if we want to go from 800 to uh, 1066 on the RAM, and since 800 is, in, is uh, only supported by CPU, but there's no dividers or anything like that you can pick to get higher unsupported. So, what we need to do is also drop the multiplier, which should be 16 by default, 200 times 16, 3200. We can drop that to 12. So this would give the same, essentially the same uh, CPU speed on the CPU. And I also need to set the voltage for the RAM so it doesn't actually post, it might not post otherwise. Advanced here, don't think, we don't need to, we should, we're not going to set anything right now. So this is only for demonstrations. We can technically set the RAM from here. I'll disable there. So you can see it is running 802T right now. 
which is the highest you can select we can select uh, here so you can say 800 is the highest you can select on an add on 64 on aim 2 the CPU doesn't support anymore and neither does the motherboard because it's uh, limited to the CPU so. uh, yeah so we can go to hardware here again just check again 1.44 volts and the jumper free here we got the uh, CPU V core and the voltage auto so we exit down save and exit hopefully it posts uh, now we should have uh, faster memory I don't think it will show that but uh, that's not the interesting part here now because we go here so you can see CPU voltage is auto I think if we go to CPU configuration it should show uh, 2.2 GHz for 3192 so 8 MHz less even uh, so you can we see see the um, yeah, it's still showing 800 but it's 1066 so we can check that once we have windows installed but if you go to power now and hardware monitor check the v-core that's 1.53 volts now you might not think oh it's 90 millivolts over 1.4 gives you uh, prime 95 but 67c i don't have a value for 1.53 but i have for uh, 1.475 and that was 95c recorded and then i shut it down or I think actually it crashed in Prime 95. So 1.53 is a real problem because uh, when I tried to run MemTest, that was the first thing I did, the computer kept shutting down and it didn't like give me any warnings. I touched the heatsink, it wasn't particularly warm at all, like a little warm in my fingers. And I was like, what is going on? But then I noticed like the CPU is idling in almost 60 C in BIOS after uh, like a stress test. So yeah, the that's not good if you if you want to trip on overtemp yeah so the only way around this uh, see here you can actually get somewhere by us jumper here if you go to CPU voltage and set it manually so you can set it to 1.4 for example we shown here and we can also go to advanced voltages because I did notice that even when I had 1.4 I was still up in like the high 80s 1.4 in prime 95 so what the thing is doing is actually overvolting the basically the excess CPU to NB HD voltage that's a hyper transport so the CPU has a memory controller and a hyper transport controller I think it's overvolting that too because it seems to be also recommended by memory manufacturers to do that. But it makes no sense because the hyper transfer bus goes from the CPU to the chipset. The memory controller in the CPU goes to the memory. They are not connected. It's not a front side bus where the front side bus goes to the north bridge where you have both memory controller and you know your PCIe or AGPU stuff. So they're not even connected. They're on the same piece of silicon but they're doing two different things. Anyway, let's save that. And uh, I have had other ACES motherboards that don't give the voltage you set until they have posted, which means they, they give default, those I had gave default voltage. So if you try to overclock and the CPU was slightly warm and it sh shut the system down and then starts to start again, it wouldn't post because warmer CPU is less stable, therefore it needs more, more voltage. So I have some ACES board that, un that they basically doesn't apply the, the, the user set voltage until they posted, which is super annoying too. Because you basically, if you shut uh, an overclock the system with down that uh, needs more weak core, you have to wait until it cools down to be able to post it again. You can reboot it, but uh, if you try to start it up when it's still warm from its previous power on, it won't work. I had at least one doing that. So let's see here, how do we monitor? So yeah, now we're at 1.44 again. And CPU temp dropped 3 to 4 degrees. Almost uh, five degrees from 43 to 38. This is idle. Uh, load is not worse. So, what we're gonna do now, because I already tested this motherboard CPU and RAM on, on like my workbench here, so what we're gonna do is use a nice feature if I can find it. Uh, you got flash from BIOS there, but uh, you got OC profiles. Another thing that is broken is this save BIOS profile. <laughs> if you save it to one day, for example, yes 
and then you try to load it from one yes no dot of home i i don't know why but it, it's broken uh, it doesn't work so load bios load from file and i can put a usb stick in here which i have as long as it's formatted with fat it should work oh i hate usb not fine See no name. It should be a bot. Yeah, so I got 1066 MOC. That's from memory. Uh, the thing is here now. I don't run a CPU overclock because this CPU can overclock, but barely. Uh, it can go to 3.3 GHz from another motherboard I have, and uh, I don't remember the voltage for primary five stable. But that's about all you can do on air. If you want to do go 3.4, you need water basically from what I read. And yeah, I don't have any block that fits, so I can't test it. But um, yeah, and more than that, you have to have some kind of like uh, dry ice or something if you want to go 3.5, 3.6. The thing is, the v, the v, if you increase the V core, like I said, from uh, 1.4 volt, I had 67 degrees in Prime 95, and at 1.475, I have 95, and it wasn't stable. 2.3 but i think the stability is not the cpu on this board it's actually the memory because i need to run 1100 megahertz and i need to lower the timings which should be here somewhere mm, config so dm timings they're already set 555 1824 is uh, well not what they're running but uh, while well, they are running that now, but next reboot I won't. I'm gonna run 15.22 on the last two. Uh, the thing is, if I want to run 1100 to even get into Windows, I need to run like at least cast 6 on the first one, but mostly 6 on all of them. Uh, on the three, the three first one here. Uh, so I think it's memory. So I basically have to pick between fast memory or slightly fast CPU. Like going from 800 on memory to 1066, that's an increase of like 32%, I think. So I'd rather take that, that over at like a 3-4% overclock on the CPU, even if that probably those percentages work more than say the equivalent percentage on the memory. The performance doesn't scale with memory bearing that much. But yeah, it's more fun because the CPU clocks like garbage, you're not gonna notice any difference between 3.2 and 3.3. So yeah, so now we have all these settings done, we can start. I actually have undervolted the CPU. We're down to 36 degrees now, because that puts it in prime 95, uh, probably in the 55 or so degrees. I don't have, um, yeah, I have one. 60 degrees prime 95, running the Mentos memory intensive load. And like I said, 1.4 gave 67, so there's a 70 drop on uh, like prime 95. Uh, and that's uh, that runs prime 95 for 24 hours, so I could maybe go 3.5. But these CPUs are not known for undervolting either. So essentially, we can install Windows now. But yeah, this this motherboard had been running circuits for almost, almost a day because I didn't realize uh, that there was overvolting the CPU, and uh, that had such a big effect. Uh, like usually, like a little bit of overvolting doesn't do that much. But but on this CPU, it's like the difference is quite quite a cool CPU compared uh, or a um, well. Mm, core meltdown basically so, which triggered the system to shut down during mem test 86 plus which is kind of annoying so yeah i'm gonna use an external usb optical unit to install i intentionally chose a case without five and a quarter bay now because this motherboard is new enough that we can install from usb a bootable device priority cd room i actually found USB CD rooms uh, using that. So, yeah, that's the next thing to do install some Windows Vista. And also, one more thing about this motherboard uh, it might be my Vista image, but that works on my Gigabyte M2 board and so on. But on this one, I cannot get Windows Vista Ultimate installed. It will crash with a blue screen at a specific point before you can create the account and stuff. The, the, the Windows Vista. Home Premium doesn't have that issue, so I don't know. And the thing is, I had an install of uh, Windows uh, Vista from my other motherboard and just put in to this motherboard because they both Nvidia chipsets from the 500 series. That just boots up, so I can use Windows Ultimate 
with Windows Vista Ultimate if it's installed on my Gigabyte board, but uh, I can't install on this machine because then it blue screens. And it works fine uh, once in the system. So, so Home Premium uh, works because I had a version of that, uh, so we're gonna run that. So, here we are in Windows Vista. Uh, I did have some uh, problems installing Windows. Oh, well, problem also took one hour 45 minutes and uh, that was apparently due to the SSD running at about 8 to 6 megabytes per second. Uh, and force uh, the chipset uh, is kind of notoriously bad on uh, the SATA controller, uh, especially with like uh, SSDs that are in SATA 6 gigabit. So I think that might have had something to do with it. I had to f uh, mess around in the BIOS a little bit. Because when I ru were running uh, Hordy Tune, I got, uh, like I said, 6 to 8 megabytes per second. So I messed around a bit. I don't know exactly what fixed it. Uh, I tried, uh, there weren't that many options to really try in the BIOS. Uh, you can turn on RAID for the controller if you want. You can change from auto to large uh, drive support, basically how it's compute uh, heads and cylinders and stuff. In the end, turning pretty much everything on seems to fix it. Uh, well, fix it, but uh, yeah, still kind of slow for what it could be. I set an um, accuracy here to fast and 8 megabytes because it's the only way of get, getting a decent score. So, right now we're just over 100. That's also the weird thing. I can get like 200 one boot, 150 another one. It's a little bit all over the place. And uh, I ran this of Sunday, I got 200 megabytes per second, and uh, that scored better than two hard drives in RAID 0, similar to what I actually had on this before. So, let's see what we're doing now. 80 or something. This is more like how you would actually run it. So, it's not particularly fast. Uh, the strange thing is, though, I had uh, an Enforce 2200 Pro chipset. Uh, it's uh, for Opteron, support as liars like this, it's basically like the workstation version of this and I had like 275 megabytes per second in Linux with that back in the day. And uh, so I booted up Linux on this and ran some Horde Parm, it's kind of quick and dirty test and that scored 250 to 260 megabytes per second. So the Linux driver does work much better. Uh, apparently the NVIDIA and Forge drivers from, from NVIDIA, their own drives, is notoriously bad. Uh, I did uh, have the previous VD green that broke, that this was an RMA for. Uh, I had that running on Windows 10 on an Enforce 4 motherboard, and uh, that works fine, but I never benchmarked it, but it didn't have like performance issues where I had to mess around in the BIOS or in Windows. So apparently it's quite common for SATA 6 devices to default to uh, uh, SATA 1.5 gigabit on the Enforce controller. Mine seems to not do that initially, so you would have to go like here. So I did enable the ID channel to it, that might actually have something to do with it, because depending on how your SATA controller is configured either to work as like an ID device or as a, a hashy device, I think. And anyway, now I set uh, remove left BIOS uh, select transfer mode. So you can select PIO. So I think this is in uh, like ID mode. Then I enabled the uh, disabled enable coin queen. And that seems to have uh, also disabled SATA 3 gigabit. Because we can see it says uh, Generation 1, 1 1.5. When I have NCQ enabled, it says Generation 3. So this is like 150 megabytes maximum theoretical. This is what Windows think it does, which is kind of low. I think it was even lower when I did uh, the enable command queen. So I actually removed it. But yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, though uh, RAID with hard drives weren't that fast either. RAID is not good for latency, so... I really don't uh, want raids here for uh, an OS system anyway. I did it for fun, just for testing a few years ago, and uh, it's been working fine, but it's not terribly fast. But yeah, 
So anyway, the, the, that's one thing to always uh, have in mind with uh, the N44 controllers, like the N44, 5, and uh, this applies apparently up to N47 or 7, like 80 and 90, I don't have those, but uh, uh, one thing I do know is that it's completely pointless running a raid like Zero with SSDs on uh, the N4 chipset because uh, the SATA 3 gigabit ports combined have a bandwidth of 3 gigabits, so throwing too fast the 3 or 6 gigabit SSDs on there isn't really gonna scale much. I think I, I used two generation, second generation SSDs, Vertex 32 gigabytes, and I gave like 10% uh, increase maybe to 275 from like 250 megabytes per second. So it's really not worth doing raid uh, SSD raid on these systems. You're better off with one single big SSD. So yeah, that kind of was the problem to get uh, the performance up. So, but now it seems to be working. So I did uh, personalize Windows Vista a bit here. So I got the room room meter up here. That's the CPU usage and memory usage, and then I have a clock. This is like Windows gadgets, it's, uh, like a thing. And then we got the, uh, uh, like a, it's called slideshow, you can open. So I put some uh, pictures of the system, the port and stuff on here. So this is when I did the graphics card a couple of years ago. The custom paint job. Yeah, so you can have a sledgehammer in, that's quite useful. Uh, after I basically sanded, I used a steel brush to get it all off on a, on a drill. Fully painted. There's uh, basically the gray is the base coat, and then black was the second coat I did to, to do the NVIDIA logo. Uh, that, that's the NVIDIA logo being paint, like put on, and then I cut it out like so. Put some color on it. And into the oven, and then you clear coat on top of all that. And the clear coat is matte, so that's why it uh, looks anodized. So, yeah, this is the card apart. One of them, I don't know if it's the broken one or the, the working one, this is the all our parts for the build, or most of them. So, yeah, something I also tried was uh, there's actually a SATA port up in this corner here. But now we can uh, anyway there's a SATA port here we got an e-SATA port here but the internal one here I did try that too that's a that's a sil through one three two but this was equally slow so yeah I think this style with SSDs and faster SATA though it seems to be kind of a pain mm. so yeah this is basically just for fun. Yeah, it's like this was never popular as far as I know. I did find on Internet Archive about a thousand of these. Uh, like you can download a thousand widgets with gadgets. So, yeah. Uh, we can run some Sys of Sandra. Uh, reason I went with Vista for this particular build is that some games actually do use this feature called, I think it's uh, Microsoft Live, it's like predates Xbox for Windows 10, so it integrates uh, some feature with games, so I think Fallout 3 uses it, well it does use it, and then I think Grand Theft Auto 4 uses it, S and then you got like DirectX 10 support came with Windows Vista, so using the GTX 295, that this uh, DX10 card, so yeah, I'm trying to target uh, like DirectX 10 and uh, Microsoft Live, whatever it was called, because it does in, does help old games that hasn't been properly updated or are just generally buggy. Uh, annoying problem with Fallout 3 running like crap on modern Windows and uh, Steam and Proton in Linux. So let's do a memory test. So yeah, that's why I went with Vista rather than Windows 7. You can technically add the DLLs you need, but uh, yeah. Some games just integrate better with 
Windows Vista from that period. So, and uh, Windows Vista is perfectly stable and fine. I mean, first version of Windows 7 is basically last version of Windows Vista, more or less. So here we have some scores. So on top is my system, current chips of memory. Uh, really don't like the grass here in uh, later versions of uh, Sys of Sandra. But uh, we're getting about 10, just over 10 gigabytes per second. So this uh, FX system or uh, the 790FX chipset for Phenom, which is using a Phenom 9700. Uh, has uh, basically DDR800 at low timings. So you can see we can, we're kind of beating that out. Uh, under there we got the N4780i, so that's an Intel CPU using DDR2-9600. I don't know what frequency it is, but it's like 1200 megahertz or something. And we're apparently beating out much faster DDR2 at same timing. And under there we have the 790i, which should also be an Intel N, with the DDR3 uh, PC 10600, so that should be, I think, 1323 MHz. So that's getting beaten too. So yeah, in terms of memory bandwidth, we're kind of killing it here. And that's probably the only thing we're killing with this CPU, this chipset. Uh, can run some CPU benchmark. So here we have some results. Uh, Let's see, yeah, I have uh, the same CPU as mine as a control. Uh, I scored a little bit better, could be due to the extra memory bandwidth. Uh, then we got an uh, E8200, I had an 8400 at some point, I don't think the 8200 was that popular. I had one too, not that long ago, I gave it to a friend. I uh, got it out of a uh, old HP or something. Just a motherboard trap system. And then we got uh, an X6800, so it's like a higher clock, but an older one. Still beating my CPU, obviously, it's like quad core, so it's gonna be overall fast in multi trading. Then under there we have the E6700, which is more like the straight out competitor, that than the 6750. So we kind of like tied more or less with that one. Just a little bit above according to this particular benchmark. So yeah, the core to do is faster, but that I already knew. Uh, I don't like the core to do uh, do though really because they lack integrated memory controllers. Uh, I just feel the whole platform is kind of old. The only thing good is the fact that the CPU is actually faster, which you could argue is the only thing that matters. But yeah, uh, I like the cleaner way the AMD platform is designed, but uh, yeah, no denying the core to do is the faster one and it overclocks better, so, but the K8 at this point is a very old CPU, so, so yeah, we can see I have lowered the, the multiplier for the hyper transport bus, uh, it's running at just about 1000 megahertz and 1000 is stock, set it from to 4 instead of 5, it's probably fine at 5, but uh, no point pushing more. At the 1 gigahertz, it's equal to the bandwidth of the PCIe slot, so that should cover the graphics card. And I undervolt the CPU a little bit, it says 1.408, so I set uh, 1.375 on the Bison, it's perfectly fine in Parliament 5, and does lower the temperature like 6 or 7 degrees. So that's pretty nice. So our RAM. So yeah. We can see our RAM is running 531 times 2 because it's DDR, so we have to double that if we want to get the effective clock. This is the actual clock of DDR. But as we can see here, 
It's called EPP, I think it's Extended Performance Profile, which is like a Corsair slash NVIDIA thing. Uh, I don't think it's used anymore at all. It was kind of... came out with DDR2, I think there might have been some DDR3 with it, but uh, XMP basically took it over from Intel Extreme Memory Profile. But it's like an extension to JDEX uh, SPD profiles. So. Yeah, so it can tell like command rate T2, and this motherboard should support that, so according to BIOS uh, history. And then we got sensors here for the for the ETX 295, and this basically reports two cards because of this technically two cards in SLI. So you can see current here draw uh, one of the GPUs, you can see the, vol uh, the temperature of each phase. So each GPU has three phases for V core, and V core is just, just over a volt. Fan RPM over 2000 at idle, which is annoying. 3000 is the highest I've seen on load. You can see the clocks. It does have lower clocks at idle. You can select the other card. That's a little bit less info since it doesn't have any fan, for example. So I find that uh, if you want to run Unique Haven, that OpenGL at least for SLI is faster. Uh, get, get much high utilization of both GPUs. It does scale up well otherwise with DirectX 9. Uh, I don't know if that applies to single GPU in the, the 200 series line. So, But uh, it's a pretty good stress test, especially at 1080p. But since my capture card can only do 1080p, it's kind of... And if I want to show anything on the desktop, it's kind of annoying trying to run 1080p. You can do it and just shove some of the window outside of the visible screen area. But yeah, the, the GPUs do scale up to 1080p and the utilization goes up even more compared to 720. But the frame rate is kind of horrible at 1080. Probably around 30 FPS and this is closer to 60. So this is pretty f quickly going to heat up our GPUs here, I think. So we can see the temperatures here, around 80 on one GPU instead of 7 on another. I think it's gonna keep rising a little bit more. But it is pretty cold inside today, so... It might not go higher. Also, as I said, going 1080p is probably adding another 4 degrees on them. And this is the other GPU, you can see here. Just dipped a bit because... Uh, when probing it, it's hard for a while. And you can see it's a bit harder than the other one. And we can see the current draw here. I'm not sure, I don't know how to measure current. If that's per phase or total, because if that's total times voltage, that's not a lot per, for a GPU, about 30 to 40 watts. Uh, makes more sense if it's per phase, that they're just measuring one phase. but. Uh, at the same time, I don't know what these phases are rated for, but the single piece of inversion is rated for 35 amps per phase. That's what uh, MOSFET or power stage can do, but you shouldn't really push, push it to its max because its power efficiency goes out of the, the window. And so on the single PCB version, you would hit almost 10 watts uh, heat per MOSFET when you have three of them, if you were pu pushing 35 amps each. Oh so, yeah. Just hit hit the one there, one GPU. While we're at it, you can check the temperatures of the CPU. Of that report, and then it reports around uh, 42 to 49. Of course, one is hotter. But like I said the earlier in the video, increasing the V core makes this skyrocket to uh, like 95 I've seen as the highest so. and that was just below 1.5 volts so and that was in prime 95 it usually doesn't skyrocket in normal programs but yeah and uh, we should see some fans I did hook up some of the fans to the motherboard uh, and set some profiles in the BIOS so CPU is running at 800 rpm and all the case fans are rated at 1200 when I tested them uh, and they're running about 1000 now. I think they run like 800 idle. Mm. I 
the CPU is like 600 idle, I think. Uh, so we're running crisis here, and uh, I set uh, the graphics to medium. That's also auto detected because high when I'm trying running 1080p or 4040p it seems to run out of VRAM. We've got 896 megabytes per GPU, which is also the total. So I'm running as the line. I could probably set some of these to high, but I haven't uh, going, been going through them enough to figure out which ones I can get away with. So for now, everything is just medium, 1080p. I have fraps running. I can actually use uh, built-in FPS counter in Crisis, but I decided to use fraps because we're going to use the stats for other games too. Uh, and the capture card is limited to 30 FPS. I can't record anymore at 1080p. So budget capture card, USB one. So I'm just gonna load up the uh, game here. So recording at 30 FPS is gonna make the game seem kind of stuttery, I would suppose. And tear a bit since the game will actually output at least 60 FPS usually. So it's gonna tear a bit like uh, just like when you have VSync up. That's just a limitation of my capture card. I can't capture the actual frames and uh, running a software on the computer would tank the FPS with like two thirds and then we were looking at 20 FPS instead of 60. This is Dr. Helena Rosenthal at the IAS research team stationed on the Lingshan Islands. We... See you guys at the LZ. So we're in free fall here. I have been playing on this hardware before, uh, in my old case, before I got the new RAM and stuff. So I had 6 gigs of RAM and a different case, and I had a, did have a broken 295 that ran for a while. And yeah, that could do 4040p no problem. Uh, we mainly CPU limit, I suppose, in some sense, but the whole point with a graphics card like the GTX 295 was to run up to 1600p, so you have uh, 16 by 10 back in the day, that would be your 4040p today in terms of width, so 2560 by 1440 today, would have 2560 by 1600 back then. I suppose they figured if we could afford one or two of these cards, uh, you could afford a good monitor too, I guess. It's kind of why I want this graphics card, because I can run on my modern phone. 1440p monitor. I got two of them now. The old one is kind of ghosting at this point, burning in a little bit. So old, but it's still perfectly usable. This one I have for a lab now. So I figured I could play on that with native resolution. It's gonna be nice at 60 hertz. I, I IPS monitor. I put that some stuff here. You should really one shot them in the head, but <laughs> I can't even be bothered with that right now. But yeah, we're hovering around 60, give or take. Crisis is kind of all over the place, depending on where you are on the map. Okay, Aztec, 
So yeah, I suppose this is Crisis, and it uh, runs pretty well considering how old this system is, or relatively speaking. So what I would like to actually play on this computer is Fallout 3, it's one of my favorite games. So the forced high quality. Okay, let's do that, there we go high. And I usually go to and days off. You can uh, with DCB you should be able to have it on, but uh, I'm gonna run native resolution later, so I might put it to uh, say two samples or something. Figure that out. I haven't really changed anything here right now. It's whatever high sets. So and VSync is off, and also turn off VSync in NVIDIA control panel. Otherwise, it still locks the VSync because that option doesn't work apparently. Uh, the thing is the game can bug out if it runs way too fast but it v seems to turn in because I made a custom third hertz profile for the Windows desktop in the NVIDIA control panel for my capture card so I think that's why the game run is 30 I think you should run 60 otherwise and uh, so V-Sync is off as you saw in the beginning you know, it's stuttering here when it's loading but yeah, this is uh, just after you start the game and create Megaton. a character. Uh, little Megaton, I think it's called. Uh, this city here. So yeah, this is 1080p high. And we're hovering around 60, which is pretty fine since I got a 60 Hz monitor. So I could even v sync lock this if I wanted to. And like I said, if it's a bit stuttery and jerky and tearing, it's my capture card can only do half the frames, 30 FPS. Around half. I haven't tried this in 4040p yet, but I'm gonna do that soon uh, without the capture card. But yeah, essentially, this is what I'm gonna be playing on the system, that's the plan. And it seems to work fine. I have played back like i said before i swapped the graphics card and the ram and i had an only case a couple of years ago i did try fallout 3 on this machine and uh, in some uh, later end games with over like 100 fps in some places quite easily so uh, it should be perfectly fine for this game and uh, yeah, i found this game to work quite well on the vista uh, they just recently patched out uh, Microsoft Live uh, part uh, on it on Steam, maybe not that long ago, not that many months ago, I think it was this year. Uh, but it still crashes for me like every 20 minutes at best, that's the most I can get between crashes, so it's basically unplayable. But yeah, I wonder if we can do something here. Then to the sound of bomb, we have successfully disarmed the bomb. So anyway, that's what I'm gonna be playing on this system. So I filmed the monitor because I can't capture more than 1080p. And it's got a little bit blown out, but I set the resolution to 2560 by 1440 and everything to medium except textures. So I set it to high. And the uh, crisis runs just fine, about the same frame rate as before. So the card is fully capable of. Uh, delivering around 60 fps in crisis so in uh, fallout 3 i also set 1440p and it uh, gave me roughly the same frame rate as uh, 1080p uh, still running high settings so it's perfectly playable as you can see So yeah, this is my GTX 295 slash Athlon 64 X2 slash Windows Vista machine.
So thank you for watching and have a nice day. If you want to follow us, you can go to our social media webpage braindrainlearn.tk and pick your favorite platform. Link is in the description. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public lands when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.